I got love for you, man. You know what, I'm <laughs> what are we talking about? You know, I'm not here to start any trouble. I'm only going to say nice things about you from now on. I think you're handsome, and I think you're a wonderful host. I'm fat and I'm overweight. Just don't say anything silly. I was waiting for you to say that. I'm not laughing about it. You think this is funny? I take this serious. You know, I don't want y'all to take anything out of context that I'm saying. He's very funny. He likes to joke around a lot. As a personality and as an entertainer, yes. This is going to be really quick. I'm not taking any questions. Go ahead and get comfortable. I'm going to talk for a little bit. You're listening to Cabby Presents, the podcast. Welcome, 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 welcome to the show. I'm your host, Cabby Richards. On Twitter, it's at Cabby, C-A-B-B-I-E. On Instagram, it's the real Cabby. Same C-A-B-B-I-E spelling. Happy holidays, everybody. I love this time of year because people are generally happy the weather sucks in canada that's the crappy part but this month people are shopping people are finding things to give to one another whether it's material things or it's a it's it's love and attention and quality time so thank you for the happiness people my guest today makes me happy One of my oldest friends, I started in the television business with this young man as we were students at Ryerson University in the radio and TV arts program. When you hear us refer to inside baseball, it just means it's like an inside story. And it might be too inside, so bear with us. Uh, We don't get to it too much, or we don't stay too much inside baseball, but we're just kind of geeking out. Very proud of this dude and very happy that he joins me on the phone right now. If it's going to be uh, an interview, I'm going to conduct it. So I'll answer my own questions, ask myself the questions, then give y'all the answers. The first time I met this man was the first day of university. It was a Tuesday morning at 8, 10 a.m. American Literature with Roberta Imboden. God bless her. She um she kind of looked like the actress from Throw Mama from a Train. So that's why I had to preface it with God bless her. Uh, I sat next to him, and after our professor mentioned uh, us as a class, you know, having first day jitters, I made some joke about it being her first day, and my guest humored me by uh, with a chuckle. And uh, and in our next year at Ryerson, we interned together at Headline Sports before it became the Score Television Network. Since then. He became one of the few Canadians that made the jump from Canada to the United States in TV broadcasting, more specifically sports broadcasting, following the footsteps of John Saunders, Dan Shulman, and David Amber, to name a few, working at the worldwide leader at ESPN. He is the most talented member of our university crew, the Hard Eight. And uh, here's a sample of his, of a small sample of his resume. Okay, from what I remember. Okay, so he anchors Sports Center. Check. He hosts uh, the Scott Van Pelt Show on ESPN Radio from time to time. Check. And this summer hosted Baseball Tonight on ESPN. I am pleased to be joined by Adnan Verk. Hello, sir. Uh, an outstanding intro, Cab. I, it is filled with lies and hyperbole, but I would like <laughs> you to deliver that exact same address at my eulogy or my second marriage, whichever one ends up happening. <laughs> <laughs> it will be the eulogy. It will be the eulogy first. <laughs> and, but I'm not sure if I'm going to be there, though, man. You're, you're going you're gonna to go to a healthy 88, 89. I'm out at about 51. You know, I'm starting to wonder more about death, and I don't know why that is. I'm, I'm, I'm 35, you're 36, so I don't know why. Maybe 40 is starting to approach. I know 40 is a new 30, and, and both you and I try to stay young and active and such. But I used to always think if, if I could get to 70, that'd be a good run. And I'm not sure why, but I'm starting to be haunted by the thought 70 may be a reach. Well, <laughs> you're, you're kind of an old soul, Virk, so maybe like <laughs> maybe that's why 70 has just sort of like appeared in your mind, because that's just... From as, as long as I've known you, you just like you're like the one dude at 19 that was into jazz, and we're like, what? What? What do you mean jazz, dude? That's like, <laughs> that's like, what do you, you? You're not friggin' uh, Louis Armstrong, you know? It's like, I know you love, you know, classic 70s cinema, Italian cinema, jazz, and baseball, all archaic. <laughs> it's it's funny that you you mentioned 70 because you you do have like the sensibilities of a 70 year old, but trapped in like a 30 year old's body. 
Yeah, I've never been confused with somebody who is down with the times or somebody who's resistant to change, because I'm still <laughs> such a, a fossil from decades ago. It's funny, all the stuff that you mentioned, you're right. When I, when I told the bosses of the East Penn I wanted to work on baseball, they said, you've got to be the only guy in his 30s who says that. Everybody else wants to be on, on NFL and, and college football and NBA and obviously sports that I love, as you as do you. But, yeah, it's, um, I'm not sure why it is, man. I'm kind of, kind of, a, kind of an old soul, like you said. You really are. And, okay, so I, I do want to get to some baseball uh, talk in a bit. But before before I get to that, a couple of weeks ago I had a conversation with um, a friend of mine uh, named Todd Shapiro, and we were exchanging, like, bad interview stories. Mm-hmm. And I had one, It's maybe not bad, but it wasn't, it, was, it didn't meet my expectations. My expectations were higher than, unfortunately, you know, what the reality was. So Is this I, Jeter that you're talking about? No, no, not <laughs> Jeter, no. Not your beloved Derek Jeter. <laughs> Derek Sanderson Jeter from <laughs> Kalamazoo, Michigan. I only know that stuff because of you. Like, <laughs> it's so unnecessary to say his middle name, and yet I just continued to do it all those years. Yeah, you do. And do you actually do you say it on Sports Center also or on Baseball Tonight? I still do. And then people, I mean, there's like one or two hockey fans that look kind of like Derek Sanderson. You mean like the Bruins guy? I'm like, yeah, you know, Jeter's dad is a doctor, help with drug rehabilitation, help the Bruins star. They're like, okay, yeah, whatever. Why don't you just call him Derek Jeter? I'm like, hey, old habits die hard. Is that how he got his middle name? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Dr. Charles Jeter uh, helped uh, the Bruins star Derek Sanderson, who was suffering from, like, alcohol rehab and got him through it. And then uh, Jeter's dad, yeah, named his son after Derek Sanderson, the former Bruin. Oh, I had no idea. Dude, I'm just learning. People are learning on the Cabby Presents podcast. <laughs> um, so so I'm, I've had this conversation with Todd, and I recently, I was recently in New York, and I interviewed Sylvester Stallone. And, right. and Robert De Niro for the movie Grudge Match. It was unbelievable. It was, it was, <laughs> it was a press junket. It's weird. It, not weird, but it was. It was like a surreal moment looking at Robert De Niro and not, not just looking at him, but him looking at me because yeah. like he's this revered iconic actor and um, and I'm like, wow, that's like that's like De Niro. And he was only there as a favor to Stallone. I'm sure of it because he never does junkets. He rarely does interviews on Letterman or Leno like he just he that's that's not what he's into he's in his art and he's into not staying at home because he works you know for, the guy does eight movies a year much like you you have like eight jobs at ESPN you just don't like being at home you but just, I was gonna say the reason why De Niro's doing these junkets you know what that means the movie's absolutely dreadful and he's doing everything he can to promote this turkey because he knows it's opening Christmas day maybe he invested some money into it he's like hey listen I, I'm willing to put my face out there, right? Because if it was a great movie, you're right, he would just do the typical De Niro, which is just hang out in his lair and just do his method <laughs> acting, but, but, but hanging upside down, whatever he does. Because he knows it's awful, he's like, all right, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll suck it up and do it. I want to know, did you do a De Niro impression to him? Because no. Because there's a few people that I know would be gutsy enough to try that. No, no, no. When, I, when, you're, when you're looking at a legend, I just, I just all respect do. Um, but here's the question that I asked Todd. It, and, and I know you're such a De Niro fan, so I'm not sure if you can objectively answer this question. Yeah. At the height of their fame, Sylvester Stallone's fame and Robert De Niro's fame, who do you think was more popular? <sighs> I'm talking global fame, just yeah. fame. You know, that's a great question, Cap, because you're right. Stallone, I mean, those Rocky movies are juggernauts. I mean, there are dudes at work who are still reciting Rocky IV, and, and they'll, they'll use references about Mr. T and Clubber Lang and all that stuff. And you're right, De Niro was always, you know, just he's such a critical darling, and, and, and movie people have always revered him. But I do think his popularity, like, when I think of, like, Godfather 2, I mean, that was an enormous box office success. He won an Oscar for it. It wasn't like he was doing some quiet indie movie. He was doing major films. Like, I mean, Raging Bull didn't make a ton of money, but, again, when you win an Oscar, people are knowing who you are. You're, you're at the major ceremonies and such. I would tend to think on a global level it would have to be Stallone, because you're right, Rocky translates through all different languages and such. But, I mean, both those guys are just such titans. I mean, I don't even, I don't even know how you kept your composure. I would have just been, been mumbling and stumbling. Who was, who was the more engaging of the two? I'm going to guess Stallone by default. Uh, you are 100% correct. I think De Niro spoke five words in our four-minute <laughs> encounter. And did, did he at least made eye contact with you. Like, he, did, he, did, he, did he force a smile or was it more of a grimace across his face? Uh, he forced a smile. Actually, one time I got him to chuckle because, nice. I, because I said, sometimes you just got to punch a dude in the face. And that got, that got him to chuckle. <laughs> but it was, if I can rate my own performance in that interview, it was a solid four and a half out of ten. Come it on, was, oh, you, it you was, have always 
been your harshest critic? No, it was not good, Virk. I'm telling you, it was it was not good. And I recently interviewed uh, Will Ferrell in in Winnipeg. Again, I'd say my performance was a four and a half out of ten. No, I'm like uh, Will Ferrell likes you because I remember the first time you interviewed him. You were at the score. And you guys got along well. There's a couple. Yeah, of good, he didn't. Good he didn't. Back he, didn't remember, he didn't remember that. <laughs> 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 I was just some round face reporter uh, from like. I, I guess he knew TSN maybe, but you know he's been on this whirlwind tour to promote Anchorman because he's personally invested in the like financially invested in the movie. It's his production company, Gary Sanchez, that is uh, that is uh, uh, foot the bill for Anchorman too. So that's why he's doing this like insane well, like uh, publicity or marketing campaign before Anchorman two comes out. And that's why I wanted to ask you, because exactly what you said, he has been so ubiquitous. He's on a North Dakota TV station. Yes. He's doing curling, as you mentioned, TSN. He did some stuff with us. He was on the Dan Patrick Show. That means, again, part of what you said is true, that yes, he has money invested into this. And secondly, the movie is going to be dreadful. I mean, let, let's be honest. How many comedy sequels can you list to me that are either as funny as the original or just on their own funny. I, I, we honestly went through this at work and started doing this. Listen, listen, I hope the movie's great. I enjoyed Anchorman. I think he's a good dude. But if you go through the percentages cap, it's like 20% of comedy sequels are actually any good. Wow. Okay, I, I got I to let that digest. But let me just t- first tell you, I, I have seen Grudge Match. It's not good. And I, <laughs> and I have seen Anchorman 2. It's, it's good. I don't know. I wasn't a huge fan of the original Anchorman. I thought it was funny, but I've only, I think I've only seen it once, but it's right. probably one of the most quotable movies in the last two decades. Like so many people reference, I'm a big deal, scotchy, scotch, scotch. Like this, this right. movie has, there are a few knee slappers. Like the way that you laugh when you, it's almost like you are like a stereotypical black person, like an American black dude from like <laughs> Missouri, because you you are so boisterous in your laughter. Um, so there are some moments like that, but I don't know if people will think it's as funny as the first one. But yeah, there are some quotables, I, I but not say, as many quotables. Right. I mean, you've seen it, so obviously you you can speak to that. But I would just sense from the outside looking, and it looks like you get a bunch of funny dudes together: him, Carell, Rudd. And like, all right, let's just kind of do what we did last time. Probably a lot of improvisation, which they're thinking is funny, and they go in the edit room, they're like, well, it's not necessarily working. Let's just kind of slap it all together. I mean, I hope I'm wrong. Obviously, you've seen it. I'm sure it's going to make a ton of money. Like you said, the PR campaign has been ridiculous for this movie. But you're right. I don't know if it's just because we work in television, and I am something of an anchor man. That's why so many dudes around me can quote it. But I think you're right. It's one of those movies that just kind of, kind of has cut through the zeitgeist of, of what people love in comedies. But like you said, I've only seen it once as well. I've seen Old School many more times. Yes. Than that. Yeah. Wedding Crashers I've seen two or three times. Yes. I've always watched Anchorman once. See, I, I, was, uh, I was 100% on board with Old School. In fact, I saw Old School twice in the theaters, and I saw Wedding Crashers twice in the theaters. I only saw Anchorman once. And I, I love Old School the most of like this sort of Judd Apatow. Uh, I, don't, I, think, I think I, I want to call this era... I guess the Judd Apatow, Will Ferrell era, uh, although they don't do each other's movies, but like Apatow's camp with Seth Rogen and those guys, and then right. Will Ferrell and Adam McKay, like this is sort of an era of comedy, uh, yeah. starting with old school. And, and um, I'm sorry, uh, who's the director of old school? He looks like, he looks like um, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm blanking on his name. Todd, Todd Phillips. Todd Phillips. Yeah, who did the, the Hangover movies. Okay, so, so I think the one... One comedy, and this is 100% a personal choice, that is as funny as the sequel was The Clumps. <laughs> like, Nutty Professor 2, it wasn't a great movie. I think, I think you're on your own with this. Yeah, one. but Nutty Professor 2 is really, really funny. It's not a great movie. Again, it's not a great movie, but those, right. like, those dinner table scenes are just like Eddie Murphy is a tour de force. In yeah. uh, in Nutty Professor one and two, like he just unbelievable. And I guess Hangover two people don't didn't like as much as the first one, but right. there are some moments in that that are just unbelievably funny. Yeah, I guess it kind of felt like too much of a kind of a lazy remake. You know what I'm saying? Like rather than uh, he's with a stripper, he's with a tranny. You know what I mean? Rather yeah, than but the, baby, the tranny part is like it's, it's like disturbing. Very disturbing, but I don't think we've ever seen anything like that before. Right. Shout out to Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. I've never seen that movie, and maybe there's something <laughs> yes, like that yes. in that movie. <laughs> but uh, but that part in, in Hangover 2 was just, 
amazing. And the monkeys, the monkeys, are very funny too. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're pretty good. There's definitely some good stuff. So uh, of this, if you can remember, you guys, you mentioned that you, your uh, peers you, or colleagues had this conversation at work, yeah. trying to find the comedies that at, at least equal it, uh, it uh, equal its predecessor. Sorry, the sequels. Did you guys come up with a list or like some titles that you believe that are as funny as the original film? Yeah, we just started throwing movies, Cab, and I remember the, the ratio was poor. Like, we, we can't even do it right now. Was it Naked Gun? I'm like, no, Naked Gun 2 and a half, terrible. The, the original, was it bad? I don't yeah, remember original, Naked Gun 2 and a half. One of my favorite comedies. The second one, no, not, not nearly as funny. Um, if you go to, like, the vacation movies... Again, some guys are just nostalgic. Like, no, Christmas Vacation's great. Or, well, know, that's European isn't vacation. Christmas Vacation the third one? Yeah, third one. A European Vacation was the second. A Vegas Vacation, of course, long oh, forgotten. Oh, horrendous. <laughs> horrendous. That was <laughs> like, yeah. Just an abomination. A money grab, for sure. Yeah. But, I mean, generally, when you're going through these things, I mean, I don't think Spaceballs had a sequel, but I, it just seems like the ratio we found was very, very poor. Was Beverly Hills Cop 2 funny? No, it wasn't that. I mean, well, well, I'll say this. It was better than three, which is one of the worst movies ever Yeah, made. do you remember the when... Amusement Park and all that stuff. Do you remember how many, like, there was, there was a, I think in the opening, you know, action sequence, Eddie Murphy shoots his gun, like, 40 times before reloading. Like, it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's well over, it's either 40 times or over 40 times. Like, it, it makes no logical sense. But again, it's, you have, you have to have some suspension of disbelief. And, uh... And just, I want to know, because you are such a big Eddie Murphy fan, you and our friend Hussein. Yes. I, I mean, I want to know, did you, did you sit through Pluto Nash? Like, would you watch? I've never seen Pluto Nash, but I did go see Tower Heist. <laughs> or The That's Heist, or what was it? Tower Heist or The Heist? Yeah. I, uh, thought, I got it on a bootleg DVD, and I still felt ripped off. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, like I, I you can't buy bootleg. For it, you cannot. My friend Mike Kiss would say that. <laughs> An hour and 40 of my life, I'm never going to get back. <laughs> I think Mike Kiss is the first one to ever say that line. And a lot of people do. And I read. You know what he was referring to? He was talking about Boat Trip with Danny Glover. Or, or Ron <laughs> Joe Fish, Pesci. Ron Fish and Danny Glover <laughs> and Joe Pesci. <laughs> uh, this is too inside baseball, which I do want to get to baseball real quick. Okay. So, like, when you got. Okay. At ESPN, when, when the lineups come out, for Sports Center, and it's uh, you know the nightly highlights. Yeah. Do producers actively try not to be New York centric? Yeah, you know it's a good question but, because so many of those dudes, and I mean people often talk about ESPN having East Coast bias and stuff. And listen, a lot of guys that work there are from the East Coast. I mean, for those that don't know, East Penn's located in Bristol, Connecticut. It's an hour forty to Boston. It's two hours from New York, um, and then even Philly's four hours. DC is six hours. So you've got a strong amount of employees from those pockets. And listen, that's not to say guys are from L.A. or the guys in there from Texas. It, there's 4,000 employees there. I mean, you're going to find wow. supporting allegiances and, and geographical loyalties that span the gamut. But, yeah, I think oftentimes what will happen is for SportsCenter, on the earlier shows, maybe it will be more East Coast-centric. But the fact that they do the 1 a.m. sports, you know, the one that re-airs from Monday to Friday with Neil Everett and Stan Barrett, the fact that that's in L.A., they'll make a conscious effort to say, listen, obviously we're going to lead with Clippers or Lakers or Dodgers or whatever – uh, West Coast storylines, USC or, you know, college football, college basketball, whatever there is, that they will definitely cater more to that audience. But I've asked bosses about it because I said, listen, I don't, listen, I'm, I'm neither from the East Coast or the West Coast. I'm from Toronto. But I, I, I can sense people's frustration sometimes. They think we're catering to too much Yankees, Red Sox talk or Giants and Patriots and that kind of stuff. And it can be a bit off-putting. And they said, listen, rightly or wrongly, you look at the ratings and 60% of the population, 60% of the numbers are all from people east of Chicago. So if we're going to cater more towards that demographic, that only makes smart business sense. And ultimately, those cities and the passions that they have for sports generally seem to, to kind of uh, be more passionate than anywhere else. Chris Berman has said that he said if you, people ask him, well, you know, what's the greatest sports city in America? He goes, it's an impossibly difficult question to answer. But he has said if you look at New York and Philly and Boston, though those three cities in particular – there's a little bit more of the sports gene in the blood than it would be in other places. And he, he attributes it to weather. He said, listen, in L.A., who cares if the Angels win or lose? It's still 70 and sunny outside. Whereas in Philly, in the midst of December right now, you're shoveling out eight inches of snow. You're miserable. <laughs> the only, you, know, you hate your family. Your wife's a nag. Your kids are rotten. The only thing you're looking forward to is Sunday. Can Nick Foles and the Eagles beat the Vikings? So th they're so much more invested in sports on the East Coast. And that, that's from my understanding what those guys will tell me. Can you do a Chris Berman impression? 
I can, actually, because I rode one of the highlights of my World Series experience, the first World Series I covered, although the first World Series I attended was you and me back in 2000 when we went to the Subway Series, and that kind gentleman and his kid gave us their ticket stubs as they were leaving at the time it was Shea Stadium, and you and I just wandered in for four innings, watched the Mets and Benny Agbayani beat the Yankees in Game 3. Tim Robbins and Susan Sarandon uh, no longer together. I remember we were sitting a few rows in front of us. Um, but this World Series experience, Chris Berman and I uh, shared a, a car ride together. And, oh, wow, okay. And he was great. I mean, he, he is a very entertaining, very funny guy. Um, yeah, we, I was talking about being from Toronto, and I'd met him briefly before. So he remembered once I jogged his memory. He said, oh, I remember, remember, yeah, yeah, you and John Saunders and the guys that you mentioned, Dan Shulman, et cetera. So he said he loves Toronto. As, as the, the same thing they always say, Kevin, you know this as well as I do, whenever you travel in America, they always say about Toronto, oh, it's so friendly, it's so clean. People are great. You know, it's like the New York without the A-holes. You know, it's like people are just so much more polite there. And he said he remembered back in 92 when he was covering the World Series, he threw back to the desk by saying, uh, that's it for Juan Canadian Guzman and Pat north of the borders. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. And I asked him, like, how do, you, how do you come up with these nicknames? And I said, they go, I got to tell you, my personal favorite of all your nicknames and we're saying this as we're driving in Boston for Game 6 of the World Series. This is all I think about when I see your face sometimes is the Ottawa Senators and Ron Cough, Please, Tugnut. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And, and Boomer starts laughing, and he's like, yeah, man. He goes, listen, I couldn't say that in this day and age. It was back then. ESPN was a little bit more renegade. We kind of got away with more stuff. We're now owned by Disney. We're going to be clear on that stuff. But he goes, it was just something that I came up with. It was literally early in my career, just screwing around come with funny names, and he goes, it's, it's kind of surprising to me how much longevity it has had. But one of the great things about him that I think is a lesson for guys like you and me, young, young guys in the business, and still in many ways, uh, you know, even though I think we, we've established ourselves, but you're always trying to find your way and develop, is that he has not changed. Like, he, there are people that kill that guy on Twitter and social media, and he's not an idiot. He's not on Twitter, but he knows people criticize him, and they say past his prime or whatever, but he, he has never changed. He's not going to start quoting Drake. He's going to quote the Eagles and, like, some 70s band that he's into because that's who he is. And I think that's one of the great things about Chris Berman, that even just in that car ride with him, I'm like, he's as genuine a guy as you'll meet. And, and people that I've worked with that I've worked with him have said the same thing. I, I, a memory like an elephant does not forget a thing and just a genuinely good guy. But if you cross him, watch out. He'll, he'll, he'll destroy you. Wow. Um, is, that, is Chris Berman the person that people – ask you about the most when 100%. you are like out or at an event or on on location or whatever is it is it him not even close cap 100 percent. when i was at the world series st louis i just went down i know you've done this too you just want to sit in the stands for a little bit because the press box you're so far away you feel like you're just secluded from the real action so i was sitting a few rows behind and right away like you know a couple guys happened to recognize me and it's oh it's chris berman coming today oh, what's chris berman like like he is without question, an entity unto himself. I mean, he's been there for 34 years. He's got a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Uh, what I found fascinating as we were riding the car, he said to me, because the way Boomer talks is he doesn't use verbs. He's kind of like Pat Summerall that way. So what he said to me was, he goes, you know, I'm enjoying you on baseball. I said, thanks, because you, 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 you've got a real uh, passion for it. I'm like, oh, th thanks, Boomer. He goes, you, 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 people look at me, they think, they, they think football, but it, you, 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 it's baseball. <laughs> What he was trying to say was people look at me and think I'm just a football guy, but actually I love baseball as well. <laughs> and you see like Frank Caliendo and those guys do impressions of him. That's the key to the impression, is to not actually use any verbs. For example, you, you love the Titans, Eddie George. So if, if Boomer was talking to you, it was a cab, uh, a vehicle, cab, uh, Eddie George, uh, Titans, uh, 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 good, uh, Mc, McNair, uh, 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 Titans, uh, 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 Jeff Fisher, a uh, good guy. <laughs> it's just going to be a stream of consciousness and names of the associates. Oh, right. you're making him sound like a mumbling child. Yeah, like, like the last time I saw him in the hall, I just walked up and he rough riders. <laughs> 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 And that's his way of saying yes. Now, you're a Canadian. The Saskatchewan Rough Riders won the Great Cup. Congratulations. Well, thank hey, you. Thank he, you. he gets so much love here in Canada because he shows love to the CFL. I remember once he gave Milt Stiegel props for setting the all, the all-time <laughs> yes. like uh, touchdown record a few years back when Milt was still playing, obviously. And I was I just I just fist pumped the screen. I'm like, yes, Berman. Like anybody who ingra who like in endears themselves to Canadians, you will you will get a pass in Canada forever. I remember Michael Moore in one of his document one of his documentaries. He like he's like, oh, Canadians like. 
you know, like um, you're talking about how violent America is and like, oh, right across the border from Detroit is Windsor. And he, would go, he was like opening people's doors in Windsor and people's doors were unlocked. Like, you're right. Yeah. What was that? What was that? Was the one about the health care system and stuff? Like, yeah. Uh, what gun? was that one called? Um, oh, my gosh. It wasn't sicko. It was. Uh, yeah, it was sicko. It was it sicko. Was sicko. Okay, yeah. Right. And then and then someone did it recently on uh, on the. Oh, it was a G, no, no, it was a Giamatti. Giamatti yeah, it was Golden Giamatti. Globes. Yes. Yeah, when he won the Best Actor Golden Globes, he said, I'd like to thank the great city of Montreal and the wonderful country, Canada. Those people have been so great to us. Yeah, and... I remember uh, you tweeted about that. You said, hey, nothing makes us happier than getting a shout-out. Thanks. That's right. That's right. Um, okay, so Mets real quick. Uh, what's up? How, like, how do you feel about the Curtis Granderson signing? <laughs> I love the U-turn that you just made. We're talking about Boomer and Milt Stiegel. We yeah. go to Granderson. Yeah. Um, yeah, four years, 60 mil. I mean, I listen, I, I think he's a... First of all, he's a great guy. I know you've interviewed yes, him. Yes, he is a won- every, wonderful dude. Like, everyone says he's one of the best guys to talk to in baseball. Um, listen, he's 32, and he's obviously put up big 40 home run seasons prior to this past injury plagued year. But as you know, and I both know, City Field is an absolute abyss mm. to hit in. You look at former slugger uh, Jason Bay yeah. and, and what happened to him. And I mean, it's just, it was, it was painful, to, especially Trail BC. He's one of our own. He yeah. could not hit there. I don't even think now, Carlos Delgado, I, I, did, he have a, did he have good seasons in New York? He did, but you're right. It wasn't like the 40 home runs of the Jays. It was right. like 32 homers, 98 RBIs. Like it's, it's very good, but you're right. For a slugger of that skill, it's a little bit lacking. But listen, for the Mets, they had to do something. I mean, they, they haven't spent in years after all the Madoff stuff and the, the association with Fred Wilpon. So, you know what? I think for, for 60 mil for four years, for a guy who's 32 years old, has a proven track record, it's a decent signing. But there are so many Mets fans who are very uh, fatalistic at work, and, and they already were saying this could be a bad deal. Although, if you look on paper, Cab, Beltron is getting uh, three years from the Yankees. He's 36 years old, and he's getting $45 million. So I, I think you could very easily make the case that why wouldn't the Yankees have just pointed up for Granderson? But, and and Beltron, Beltron did, he did horribly in those New York years. He had to go to San Francisco yeah. and St. Louis to like revitalize his career, get out of the big market. And then now he's, I mean, hey, you got to take the cash. If somebody's already offering you $45 million, you got to take it. But back in New York with those lights, man... Only like only few players have the medal to <laughs> to exist in to play in New York, and you know you're a huge you're a huge New York baseball fan, so you see it, and plus you host baseball tonight, so you're like fully ingrained in that uh, in that sport. Yeah, it's it's awesome, man. It's 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 funny like being on baseball tonight. It's great because you're, you're with like-minded individuals, and I know you and I felt that being being at Ryerson, being at school, and it's like. Once you're around our group of friends in school who are similarly like-minded into movies and music and sports and pop culture, you just there's that comfort level that really exists there, and that's what's really cool about being at ESPN and working on a show like Baseball Tonight. These guys are like hardcore nerds; like they're just really geeks for baseball, and so I can geek out with them. And you kind of have this enclave of where you can really be a stat head. <laughs> if we were, you know, ever thrown into the population, people would think we're the biggest nerds known to man, and we can't even carry a conversation. I mean, some of these guys are just borderline degenerates when it comes to just their, their fascination with baseball <laughs> and the fascination with war and friggin' yes. uh, uh, Warp and all this. Kind yes, of stuff yes, yes, yes. But um, it's great, man. Like I, I love it. And I, I think. You know, you can speak to the fact that, like I said, when you're with people that you share the same passion with, the same interest with, it's fun. And listen, it, oftentimes the way that ESPN treats football is the way TSN treats hockey. It's just it's so yes. overwhelming and so uh, over the top at times. But listen, I get it. I mean, football is such a huge sport in this country, NFL and college football, that they have, they have dwarfed baseball in popularity. And I, I readily admit that, that on Saturdays this entire country is all about college football, and on Sundays it's the NFL, and it's... And Mondays and Tuesdays, it's still about the NFL. So yep, yep. For, for, if you really love baseball, you've got to be a real fan of the sport because you know that it's not the most popular sport. Like you said, it's an aging demographic. Um, but at the same time, you know this about me, I, I'm not into necessarily what's popular. I just like what I like, and I, and I love the sport, and, and I've been grateful enough to, to get that opportunity. And It's been great for me, man. I've had a great time. However, there are times where you do infuse some pop culture references into your, into your highlights, but it's like the most popular of the pop culture references so like <laughs> you might throw in not that i've seen you do this specifically but you might throw in a Katy perry line or like or, or something or or what i said the song roar i'm aware of her, her big hit, <laughs> right <yeah. laughs> when you were back at like the score days you would okay so you're obviously known for your movie references you would find obscure it's almost like for like the the cinema files you would like throw in like these random film references and like 
one to seven guys in the whole country <laughs> would get the reference and they would just give you that nod. And, uh, and, but then on the other hand, you would like, I remember once you referenced like, uh, the, uh, oh my gosh, what was that? Well, there's, uh, I remember there's, there's a player for the Red Wings who was Andreas Lilia. And he scored a goal, and I said, Lilia forever, which my buddy Alf at TSN, <laughs> that's like a movie about, like, Russian sex trafficking. Goes, There's so many people in the world who have seen it, much less who in the world's watching this sports cast. I rem- who knows what you're talking about? You, uh, you referenced once Mambo Number 5. <laughs> and, uh, and I was I'm like... embarrassed for that. I, I, I regret ever doing that. <laughs> in fact, I think you're making it up. I'm no, no, I'm life. telling you. That's why, that's why I feel I, like I sometimes... Kings. If there was a Mambo reference, I was Nah, you were Mambo number five. Or maybe oh. it was, yeah, it was Mambo Luke number Vegas. five. Yes. And, and you have this unbelievable encyclopedic memory. And you can just remember, like, the most random things and with, extru- like, precise detail. So the fact that you even knew the guy's name, Lou Bega, is, like, <laughs> is amazing. Because then people are like, oh, yeah, I remember that friggin' song. But then you remember the guy's name. Who the hell would remember that guy's name? Like, do you remember the group that did Who, Lets, Who Let the Dogs Out? Yeah, Baja Men. Oh my, see, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. <laughs> Anybody who thought I was cool, who's listening to this podcast, is like, that guy's the biggest <laughs> loser in my life. Can you, can you do impressions? See, okay, so I'm going to go inside baseball a little bit. For the, for the audience that's listening, when yeah. we work together at The Score, Adnan could make these, unbel- just have these pitch perfect and cadence perfect <laughs> impressions of people that we worked with. Now, to, to make it in a broader sense, can you do impressions of some of the uh, some of the analysts that you work with on Baseball Tonight? I know you work with Nomar Garcia Parra is one. Yep. Uh, and that, he's the only one I can think of right now. Barry, I can, Barry Larkin and Kurt Schilling, uh, John Kruk, who's a very crusty uh, curmudgeon. Uh, even on the best of days. He's, uh, he's Kornheiser-esque. Yeah, yeah. He's, it's funny, though. I know where you're going. I actually, this is why my uh, ability to do impressions is, is so uh, a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because you're right. For the dudes that we work with, they love it because it's, it's so inside. The problem is I can't do the famous people. Like, I don't do enough of the analysts. I'm doing, like, the coordinating producer. Like, I can do the director down to a T. So I, I probably in, uh, unveiled at least five impressions of Baseball Tonight crew throughout the year, which guys are still talk about, but it, I don't think it was any of the famous people, to be honest with you, that would kind of relate. Can you, you know, do any I, of the Im- impressions of any of your co-hosts? Yeah, you know what? See, I can't. Ravitch and Boog, I don't. I mean, they're hosts. So I don't work with them. Uh, Larkin, you know, like it's it's more kind of their their habits and their stuff off there that I could do. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Unfortunately, well, we the audience we don't see that, so unfortunately, it may, it may not resonate. But you are you are like a master, like in in. Well, no, you do you do great impressions too. And no, I don't. Knows, I do, do not. It's all about being observational. Like the, the people that, that are good at them, Aaron Boone is great at impressions because you just have to notice the little little ticks and little things people do. You used to say about our friend John Madeline, he would kind of have this habit of like his tongue. You, you said he was sucking the enamel off of his teeth. <laughs> <laughs> like it's such a visceral image of a man who's literally trying to struggle to just have, give himself a root canal. Like that, that's what you oh, have to do when you do man. the impression. You have to notice little things. Do you, uh, okay, well, some people might, I was just with uh, uh, Randall yesterday. Yesterday. Some people might know RT, who was a music yeah. video director. He's been on this podcast a few times. I'm not sure if people would know him uh, to see him or know him well enough to know an impression <laughs> of uh, our our dude RT. But um, it really just one sentence. Can I can I curse by the way? Is that okay? Yes, of course. I, yeah, we'll we'll bleep it out. Okay, so basically the biggest thing about Randall is he would try to explain things to you. And so if you were seeking counsel, perhaps in a, in a dark time, and saying, Randall, I'm just trying to, kind of, kind of trying to find the light. I'm just trying to get to the tunnel. You know, what do I do? And his advice, uh, both, I think, profound and yet elegantly simple, would be <laughs> just can do whatever. <laughs> I, that's like that's like the most famous one that you all well, among <laughs> among our crew. This is so inside baseball though. This is like <laughs> this is like two comic book nerds talking about like an indie comic book label that released like a six part series uh, that rivals a manga title or something. Like this is this is how <laughs> inside baseball we are. There's a bit on on Van Pelt and Rasilla's radio show where they said something called "Who's the Nerd." And basically, exactly what you said, video game stuff, comic books, movies, TV shows, cult stuff. And they all think that I would do great on it. I'm like, no, actually, I'll do well, you're right, to a point with some of the movie stuff. But, like, 
I don't know about Gru comic books and like like the different uh, levels of Zelda and stuff like that. Like, <laughs> like, 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 yes, you can Zelda. Be a hardcore nerd and know stuff like that. I think I think our boy Ari would do pretty well. Actually, uh, Ari Ari and Nigel would kill in in the in the comic book realm. Um, yeah. So I sent you a text uh, or I'll tell the audience I sent uh, uh, a text the other day and I said. Uh, because of your influence, and I've known you since 1996, so I've known, it's almost 20 years, a better yeah, part of two decades. 15 years we've known each other. So I, I sent you a text saying, if without your influence, and uh, when we were younger, you were a huge Philadelphia Flyers fan, yeah. uh, Philadelphia Eagles fan, uh, your baseball team, it, 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 it varies between, it's a New York, so it's either the Mets or the Yankees. I mean, you love Gary Carter, but then you revere Derek Sanderson Jeter. Right. And uh, your basketball team, it was Knicks, I believe, yeah? Yeah, but, I, but it's funny, now that I'm here, I really try to rep the Raptors, because, I mean, I feel shame that I don't rep enough Toronto teams. I, I don't know if you've found this as well when you travel in the States, but wherever dudes are from, I mean, they are fiercely loyal to their city and its sports teams. They, they find it staggering that a Canadian, that a guy from Toronto could be a Flyers fan and not a Maple Leafs fan, which yes. I think, it's a little odd, but I mean, they, 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 they're blown away by it. So I try to rep the Raptors. I was watching last night's game at Jack Armstrong singing away. I going to see Sam Mitchell <laughs> finding employment now. He's sandwiched between Rod Black and Leo Rowley. Yes, we have him over at TSN. Yeah, he's, yeah. Uh, he's great. So w- without your influence, and, and yeah. or in like the late 90s, I became a Philadelphia Flyers fan because of you, and I started watching the Philadelphia Flyers, and I despised the Toronto Maple Leafs fan base. <laughs> And I remember <laughs> celebrating that game that the Flyers held the Leafs to, was it six shots yeah. in a game or six shots in the third period or something? I feel like it was six shots in an entire game, in a playoff game. The the Jeremy Roenick-led Philadelphia yeah, Flyers. Four. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, be, and because of you, I was introduced to Mike Richards. Mm-hmm. And um, I'd only heard of Mike Richards through you, and I didn't really, and I guess I saw some highlights um, but then when I met him, I only approached him because of what you had put in my head. Right. And now Mike Richards has become my closest uh, friend who is a professional athlete. So I want to say thank you to you for that, for introducing me to uh, Philadelphia. And then this this dude who i become very close and actually hung out. Uh, they were in here. They beat up the Leafs 3-1 on a Wednesday night. And we hung out on Wednesday and Thursday before they uh, they're playing in Ottawa. Uh, this weekend, but uh, so I want to say thank you for that. That's a sincere compliment, Cap. I really appreciate that, man. I, I think I, it's, it's interesting for what you do because you are so close to these athletes. In some ways, it's terrific because you have access to them that conventional media would not have. And like you said, this is kind of a um, an extra benefit to that is you can actually develop friendships with these guys because they they let their guard down around you, and that's something that you do not get enough credit for. People don't realize that a lot of athletes are not necessarily. Uh, going to be warm and sincere and open up to talking to the media, and yet it's to your credit and your ability to keep people at ease that you're able to get that out of these guys. I can't say how many people have told me over the years, I've never seen Kobe Bryant like he was with Cabby, or I've never seen, you know, whichever athlete, Peter Forsberg, the way he was with Cabby. <laughs> <laughs> You know, well, Mike Tyson with Cabby. I mean, there, there, there's certain guys, and, and that's to your credit, they put them at ease. And I want to say about Mike Richards, the next time you speak to him, if he can engineer his way back to Philadelphia, I know he has no interest in ever returning. But please <laughs> tell him to come back. We are in dire need of his heart and soul and a player like him. Richie, Richie was the man for us. How did you become a Flyers fan? I don't understand that Flyers, the Eagles, like how did you develop your sports allegiances when you were forming them in, I guess, as a, <clears throat> in elementary school or in, or in high school? No, you're right, man. It's, it's a great question. People ask me constantly. People are consistently uh, wrongly identifying me as a Leafs fan or a Bills fan at work, and oftentimes I just don't care. I don't even bother correcting them anymore. But, yeah, the Flyers one started because uh, my brother and I, uh, big hockey fans, and as kids growing up, and he was a huge Oilers fan. He loved Gretzky. So in 85 and 87, the Oilers played the Flyers, so naturally I just cheered for the team against them, just being, you know, sibling rivalry. You know what, what that's like with your, with your brothers as well. So. I just became a huge Flyers fan for that reason. I, I loved Ron Hextall. I loved the way he played. He was so feisty, so aggressive. I had a bad temper as a kid. So I had the right <laughs> to, to throw his stick around all the time. So that's where that came from. The Eagles, I was a big Randall Cunningham fan. Nice. And where, we, where we grew up in Kingston, Ontario, it was a, we used to always get Eagles games, those weekly CBS games with Summerall and Madden, which I, I view with such nostalgia now after Summerall's passing. But 
And I remember those games was always either Eagles games or Giants games. I figured, well, I already like one Philly team with the Flyers. Might as well make it the Eagles as well. And one of the cooler things of being at ESPN, last year I got to do an NFL show with Eric Allen. And just oh, the sick. stories. I know you love football. I mean, the stories of Reggie White and Jerome, the late Jerome Brown and uh, Seth Joyner and that, that, that Buddy Ryan. I mean, the, that was a real thrill for me. I know you know what that's like when you actually meet guys that you looked up to years ago as a kid. It's always kind of surreal, but really cool. I, I um, once I filled in for Michael Landsberg on Off the Record here in, in uh, uh, on TSN, and uh, one of the guests was Eddie George, and nice, he was he was on you know he was in a studio somewhere in Arizona or wherever he was or, or in Los Angeles, so he couldn't see me, but I could see him on the monitor. So we do the interview, and it's you know I kept it light, and then after the interview, I said, Eddie, you know uh, you were my first man crush. I started following you. Uh, your career at the Ohio State on the request from one of my football coaches, and I became a fan of yours. And I'm and I saw you once at a party in Los Angeles during the NBA All Star Weekend, and I didn't go up to you because I was too nervous. And I didn't, you know, when you like revere certain players, yeah, and then you meet like you have this hero worship, and then when you meet them in real life, the the experience wouldn't meet your expectations. So I intentionally did not say anything to Eddie George just so that it wouldn't, just in case he was having a bad time or, you know, the conversation got awkward because it's weird, you know, when you're talking to fans, you and you know this, you have, to, you have to sort of, you have to put them at ease when they're like, hey, man, I love your show. Cool. And then there's like a few seconds of like silence and like, oh, thanks, man. And then you, you feel like you have to kind of make, you, you don't want the, the, the moment to be awkward, so you have to like, uh, I don't make them feel comfortable. I'm, I'm sure you do this. Uh, so that I didn't want that situation to happen with Eddie George. So, but I told him he's like, man, you should have said what's up. And I was like, ah, man, I was too. I was just being. I, I was too much of a fanboy. I would have. I would have just. I would have like probably like snorted or like it would. It would have been. It would have been terrible. I would have just been but, a disgusting mess. But who's the guy? Because Eddie George was still. I mean, you were you were in your teens at that time. You know what I'm saying? When he was really a star with. With Ohio State and then with Tennessee, who's the guy like as a kid you grew up idolizing? Because I think that would be the most fascinating if you then had to talk to that person. You mentioned I used to love Gary Carter, the late Gary Carter, Hextall. I loved as a kid. Like who's the guy for you that as a kid you were admiring? Because I think that would be fascinating if you now talk to him. Uh, I get it. There were two. It was uh, it would Bo Jackson yes. and Frank oh. Thomas, and right. um, I got a chance to interview Frank Thomas when he played one year in Toronto or maybe two years. It was like one he had a great year. yeah he had a great year in Oakland and then he signed with Toronto. And I, I can't even remember what the bit was, but Frank Thomas at one point like did a kick in the air. like He kicked over my head. I was like, dude, you are like limber. But he's like, when I approached him, he had seen my interviews on the score. And it was like, it was, it, 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 it made me feel, I, had, I hadn't had that kind of feeling before. It was, it was pretty surreal because Frank Tom, I remember that Leaf 90 rookie card. And like, that was like the, it was the Ken Griffey Jr. rookie card, uh, the Upper Deck 89, and then the Frank Thomas Leaf 90 rookie card. Those are like the two <laughs> most valuable baseball cards in my youth. And um, Frank Thomas was a bigger dude and I was a bigger dude. And I, baseball was the, was the sport that I played most often. And I just like idolized them. And it was, it was a, a, a great moment. And, and and it, it surpassed my expectations because he was so nice and he was right. just a cool dude and it was it was pretty special. Yeah, he'll be in the Hall of Fame one day so you can interview Frank Thomas at Cooperstown. And about Bo Jackson, he was actually at ESPN a couple years ago. I mean, Sick. Andrew DeCone interviewed him. And good dude, nice, but I, I will say I was a little crestfallen at how – uh, he does not pay any attention to sports now. Like, and you know this. You'll meet some of these guys that say, hey, listen, once I'm done, I'm done. And I'm like, I don't, I don't understand. Like, and it's not that it's too painful to watch. It's just, no, I enjoyed playing football and baseball, and I was good at it. But now that I'm done, I'm out. Like, he, he says he watches a lot of golf. He'll watch some fishing, and that's about it. And I was like, oh, I guess I shouldn't ask you what you think of Chris Johnson or Adrian Peterson. It's really <laughs> damn, do you? <laughs> I saw his, it was, he had a 30 for 30, right? Yeah, he did. He did. And at the really end, good. you know, he's like he's like an archer. Like he's got like yeah. he just does bow and arrows in his in his garage or in his like <laughs> on his acreage and wherever he lives. So yeah, he doesn't. Uh, he's not much of a, a sports fan. Uh, okay. But uh, you will continue to be. I will continue to be, and you will continue to entertain and inform those on Sports Center or Baseball Tonight or wherever we see you smiling and uh, we see your your eloquence on the on the set at ESPN. I know you got. I I. I I've kept you for a while, and, and I do appreciate your time, Virk. And uh, I just got to say how proud we are of you, man. Like all the all the dudes in the Hard Aid, and everybody who the Canadians that see you when they travel to the U.S. Like, oh, they see, you know, I see tweets about it, and and uh, keep it up, man. You're you're absolutely an inspiration for many of us, dude. 
No, I appreciate it so much, Cab, and I, I'm so proud as well of your success, and it's, it's kind of staggering to me, and I'm sure on you at some level as you look back at where we were in 96, uh, going to the score together, John Melville, uh, trying to impress our man way back when. Yes. With Mark Hebsher and, and Sam Sillery. That's and, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's pretty funny for me sometimes to look back and how far we've come, but I am proud of you, man. I mean, I, uh, the success we've achieved, I, I feel in a lot of ways it's been done together and the fact that we worked at the same place. And, and people often find it uh, very surreal when I tell them, oh, I know Cabby, I went to school with him and Roberta M. Bowden and <laughs> Albert Billy Nobles, our old teacher as well. Billy so. Nobles. Uh, we, we, surprisingly, I do not think a lot of those teachers would have thought uh, you and me and, and the rest of the Hard Eight would have uh, amassed the success we have had. So good on us and uh, continued success. 100%, dude. Uh, enjoy your holidays, and uh, I will see you in the new year for our annual Oscar lunch. If you can't be there in the physical, I know that you, either Hoos or uh, Jay Na- uh, John Nadlin will get an email from you with your picks as we do. Uh, I, I think this will be year 17 or 18 that we've done these Oscar <laughs> lunches where we nerd out and we give our top 10 movies of the year, best performances, and our honorable mentions. And, and I should mention, some of the lists have become a little scant over the years. Yes, man. I, 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 I think the dude is just it's just a real arduous effort just to get to six movies he may have seen over the year. Yeah, shout out to uh, Andrew Lashevsky, and it's, I think that's the first time I've said his actual government name because I called him Makowski, <laughs> and you guys call him uh, the dude who's a he's a writer at Gizmodo. That's crazy that he writes for Gizmodo, probably the most influential tech blog in the world. Yeah, um, I, I did want to ask you before we leave. What's up with uh, David Onghorn? I know you keep in touch with him. <laughs> 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 that's too inside baseball. That's that's too. That dude was balding at 19. Was completely bald. That's a tough look. It's a tough look. Anyway, man, thanks for joining me, man, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Cab. I'll talk to you soon, pal. My pleasure. Later. Thank you for listening to Cabby Presents the podcast.